Number 1. Thursday marks one full year since Andrea and Abel went missing, and many nights, her father and others in the family are still out looking for her. They'll be on Chickadee Street at about 9 p.m. Thursday to walk the path Andrea took the night she went missing on August 13, 2019. The theme, according to her father Mike Nabel, is lights will guide you home, they'll be carrying lights and hope neighbors along the route turn on their porch lamp and support. They can't host a march down the street amid the coronavirus pandemic, but they're inviting anyone and everyone to turn on their hazard lights and drive down the road with them at 9 p.m. Saturday as well. The more they do to keep the public aware of her case, he said, the better chance they have of finding her. There's still plenty of energy, Mike Nabel said Wednesday. My daughter Erin and I are mainly carrying each other as far as helping each other with our energy and keeping our attitudes and our strength and mental strength at a high level. We're working very hard. The $5,000 reward for any information leading to her being found alive has been doubled to $10,000, he said. They've heard of a few leads in the past few weeks, but until she's located, Mike Nabel said, he won't stop looking. He was briefly sidelined this summer, after contracting the coronavirus, he had a slight fever for a few days, and lost his sense of smell for a couple weeks, he said, but he's fine now, but now he's back out five nights a week looking. A 38-year-old mother of two, Andrea Nabel went missing last August. She was last seen by her sister Erin, before she walked from Erin's home to her parents' house, about a mile away in Audubon Park, just before 2 a.m. one morning. Private investigators and Louisville Metro police officials have interviewed several people about her disappearance in the years since, but no suspects have been arrested and no leads have turned up her whereabouts. The family is still working with private investigators and with Louisville Metro Police, although he said the department has been occupied lately with the ongoing protests. From January family holds prayer vigil to honor missing woman Andrea Nabel. After being missing for a year, though, Mike Nabel said, her case needs national exposure, at this point, she could be anywhere. The Nabel family is working with a Los Angeles film producer on a series about her disappearance, he said, which, like an investigation discovery piece about her that aired in April, could put her case in front of a bigger audience around the country. Andrea Nabel is 5 feet, 7 inches tall, and weighs about 190 pounds, with light brown hair. If you see her, Mike Nabel said, call the police. If someone sees Andrea, or someone they think is Andrea, the best thing to do is call 911 and then take a picture, he said. They can always call 502 to 574 LMPD, LMPD's crime tip hotline, and they can contact the missing persons unit with them, or private investigator Tracy Leonard, his number is 502-618-9337. Social media has been key too. Aaron Nabel moderates the Where is Andrea Nabel Facebook page, which has more than 13,000 followers and frequently shares information about the search. Aaron, Mike Nabel said, has shown remarkable strength in the year since her older sister went missing. Those two will be on Chickadee Road on Thursday and this weekend, hoping to bring more attention to Andrea Nabel's disappearance. It's been a hard year, Mike Nabel said, but they aren't letting up any time soon. Private investigators are still working. The family is still working, he said. Nothing has stopped, and I do mean nothing. Number 2 Peter was last seen in Lexington, Kentucky on February 16, 2018. His wife, Bertie Eaton, went to the police on February 19 and said she hadn't seen her husband in three days and that the last time she saw him, at their apartment on Locust Hill, he had gotten into an argument with her brother, Willow Bruce Cherry, and Cherry was on top of him beating him. Bertie said she became frightened and left the apartment with her three-year-old daughter and her sister-in-law, Misty Cherry, and they went to the apartment complex pool. She returned to the apartment about 50 minutes later, but didn't go into Peter's room. Eaton said the door to the bedroom was closed and she could hear Peter groaning and asking for help. She left the apartment again and went back to the pool and spoke to Misty, who asked her not to call the police because Willow had an outstanding warrant for his arrest. Bertie went back to the apartment and Peter's bedroom door was still closed. Willow was there. 
He told her Peter had left and asked her not go too into the bedroom. She didn't go in or question him further because she was scared. Bertie went to sleep in another room and when she woke up, she finally went into Peter's room and saw blood on the carpet. She went to her father's house and after not hearing from her husband for days, she contacted the police. Based on Bertie's statement, the police got a warrant to search the apartment. They found blood under the carpet in Peter's bedroom as well as blood-saturated clothing and washcloths. There was a lot more blood under the carpet than on top of it, indicating someone had tried to clean up. Willow's stepfather, Whitney Eaton, said he saw Peter's Ford Explorer in Willow's driveway and asked him about it, and Willow said Peter had given it to him. He asked Whitney to help him clean some blood from the vehicle, but Whitney refused. Willow later told him, Peter just wouldn't stop fighting. Whitney noted that Willow had Peter's cellular phone as well as his vehicle. When police searched the Ford Explorer, they found a large amount of blood in the back storage section. A photo of Willow is posted with this case summary. He was indicted on a charge of evidence tampering in August 2018, and in September, he was charged with Peter's murder. He stated he did not kill his brother-in-law, but remembers little about the night in question, including what he and Peter were arguing about or how the fight ended. He claimed he was drunk that night and suffers from mental problems. Peter's case is not the only disappearance Willow is associated with. In 1994, his girlfriend, Elizabeth Acton, disappeared from Virginia and was never found. Willow hasn't been named as a suspect in her case, but Acton's co-workers stated she was afraid for her life and told them that, if anything happened to her, the police should look at Cherry. Peter's body not been located. Willow is awaiting trial in his case. Foul play is suspected due to the circumstances involved. Number 3. Officials continue to find no viable leads in the case of Anna Lee Manning, a Boyle County woman who has been missing about 24 years. But deputies aren't giving up. All it takes is one person to break the silence, said Boyle County Sheriff's Deputy Philip Dean, the lead deputy on the case. Dean discovered the cold case on Manning last year, after it fell in his lap. In February 2016, he reached out to the public via the Advocate Messenger, seeking any information about the case. Dean received a multitude of tips, some of which led deputies to a five-acre property on Spring Valley Drive in Lincoln County, owned by Richard and Barbara Manning, the parents of Anthony Manning, Anna Manning's estranged husband. That portion of Spring Valley once belonged to Boyle County, but was later annexed into Lincoln County. Despite spending about 11 hours searching at the scene with investigators from the Lincoln and Boyle Sheriff's offices, Kentucky State Police and an FBI crime scene unit with cadaver dogs, nothing conclusive into the disappearance of Anna Manning was found. The dogs did lead investigators to areas of interest, prompted the moving of an outbuilding and a camper on a skid loader, as well as the digging up of property in several locations. A cache of weapons was found, about 24 guns, including shotguns, rifles, and handguns. At the time, then Boyle County Sheriff Marty Elliott said evidence was uncovered, but was taken by the Federal Bureau of Investigation to be examined. It was later revealed to be a bone from an animal. Manning was last seen on November 19, 1992 by her aunt, Elsie Williams, on North 3rd Street in front of Chin's Jewelry. She hollered and said she had something to talk to me about. But I've never seen her again, Williams said in an article in the Advocate Messenger on March 1, 1994. Manning was 25 when her aunt last saw her and was with a white male who was never identified, Dean said. She was supposed to visit her aunt later that day, but never made it. At the time, she had a two-year-old daughter. Manning was described as having red hair, being about 5 feet 10 inches tall, and weighing 108 pounds. She would now be about 47 years old. She had blue eyes and a scar on her right pinky. Seven months before her disappearance, on April 16, 1992, a police item in the Advocate Messenger reported that an Anthony B. Manning, 25, of 148 Spring Valley Road, turned himself into police after his estranged wife, Anna Manning, signed a warrant for his arrest on a charge of kidnapping. Anthony Manning took his two-year-old daughter to visit Anna Manning at her apartment on 510 N. 3rd Street, 
where he told her he wanted to have sex with her, according to the news archive. When she refused, he handcuffed her and led her to the back door. As he went to take their daughter and Anna Manning's purse to his car, she escaped to a neighbor's house to call the police, according to the archive. On May 3, 1992, public record states that Anthony Manning was given 182 days in jail, 152 of those probated, for a charge of unlawful imprisonment. It wasn't until 15 months after her disappearance that a formal missing persons report was filed on February 25, 1994. Police searched Fayette and Jessamine counties due to rumors, but she was never located. According to the 1994 article, Manning had lived with her aunt since she was 13. She had married Anthony Manning in 1985, and after marrying, she grew distant from her aunt and other family members, according to Williams in the 1994 article. The separation was such that Williams didn't know where the Mannings had lived, she said in the article. Dean said deputies won't give up on finding out what happened to Manning until they know the truth. We're not going away. We're not going to stop. I hope someday someone will do the right thing, he said. It's not right, someone disappeared that long ago, and we have no answers. Besides not knowing Manning's fate, Dean said investigators are also seeking any information on the unidentified man that was with her, but nothing has come out yet. Dean said he wastes no time in investigating when information comes in on the case, following up on them immediately. It's the right thing to do to get the case solved, he said. Dean is convinced there are people in the community who know what happened. There are some people that know what happened and are not talking for whatever reason they don't want to get involved. It's a cold case from 1992, you've got to have community help on that, he said. We're pleading to the public to help, for closure for the family. If you're not talking then it's not going to get solved. Anyone with information into the disappearance of Anna Lee Manning over 20 years ago is asked to contact law enforcement. Callers can remain anonymous. The Boyle County Sheriff's Office phone number is 859-238-1123. Number 4. At age 6, Marie Four's father disappeared. Harry Miller Maupin, 40, vanished June 18, 1985. Maupin was a resident of Madison County for 38 years before his disappearance. On Thursday, Kentucky State Police in Harlan arrested Ernest Lee Hensley, 59, of Corbin and charged him with Maupin's murder. 4. 32, of Richmond, lived with her sister, father and mother in Waco in 1985. Maupin was in the coal industry, 4 said. She said her father had traveled to the community of Shields in Harlan County for business. He had a few different businesses in the coal industry, she said. With his business partner, Harold Bingham, Maupin owned Gaino Coal Company and Aqua Processing Incorporated, which made coal processing equipment. Maupin also owned Maupin Grain Company in Waco, but sold that company a few years before his disappearance. Maupin stayed in Harlan County when he traveled for business, but considered Richmond his home, Four said. He sometimes stayed in an office trailer on mine property. A news story in a 1985 edition of the Richmond Register incorrectly stated that Maupin had moved to Harlan County, Four said. Her father loved the outdoors and she said, was outgoing and kind. And although Four was young, when her father was last seen alive, her memories of him still are vivid. Her memories aren't clouded with the innocence of childhood, Four said, her recollections of Maupin match with those of others. He was the type of person who would always go out of his way to help someone else, Four said. He was a genuinely nice person. He was the kind of person who never met a stranger. He was just the kind of person who always saw the good in people, she said. Four said that losing her father at age six had an impact on her life. It makes you appreciate the time you have with the people you love, she said. Maupin's body has never been recovered. He was declared missing on June 20, 1985. Four said her father was declared deceased by the state after several years. The investigation into Maupin's death was begun by the late trooper Jack Howard of Post 10 and Detective Denny Pace, who was been retired for several years. The case became the responsibility of Post 10 Detective Kevin Cornett, because murder cases are never closed, said Walt Meacham, Post 10 Trooper First Class. The information we received was that he was shot, 
which caused injuries that resulted in his death and Hensley removed Maupin's body from Harlan County and disposed of it in a way to where it could not and probably will not be recovered, Cornett said in an interview with the Harlan Daily Enterprise. We have information that tells us where the body may be, but we can't give that out just yet because we've got to try and do another search of that area. KSP detectives believe Maupin was killed on coal mining property of the Gano Coal Company. The information that we have is that the murder took place on the mining property and Maupin's body was then taken elsewhere, Cornett told the Enterprise. Cornett also said that the cases are ongoing and as the investigation progresses, there may be co-defendants and possibly future arrests. Hensley was on parole through the Williamsburg Probation and Parole Office, which was where he was arrested, Cornett said. Four said she and her family are grateful to the troopers and detectives at Post 10 for continuing an investigation which spanned decades. I think my whole family was just really thankful to the state police who continued to work on the case. We're thankful they have, Four said. There's just a lot of gratitude to the state police. It's been 25 years, and for them to keep working on it, we're really appreciative of their work. Four said she and her family plan on attending court proceedings regarding the case. Hensley is being held in the Harlan County Detection Center on a $1 million cash bond. He has been charged with one count of murder, a Class A felony, and one count of tampering with physical evidence, a Class D felony. Number 5. Clayton McCarter went missing in January 2014 from Bowling Green, Kentucky, after authorities believe he and another boy, Rodney Scott, ran away. Tuesday was Clayton's birthday, said Lynn McBride, the president for the Center for Search and Investigations, the division director for NOMAD, the not-found-yet division of Team CFSI, Center for Search and Investigations. She told Oxygen that Clayton turned 19 last week. Unfortunately, we have seen a few birthdays come and go with Clayton still missing. Police believe that Clayton and Rodney ran away from the facility for children that they were staying at. Clayton has ADHD and oppositional defiant disorder. According to his mother Rita McCarter, doctors said that Clayton had the mind of a five-year-old. She said that her son's disappearance has been very difficult on her family. Clayton has two biological siblings and a step-sibling. It's been hard, but we pray and we still talk about him, she told Oxygen. Our little one will say something that Clayton would say and we are reminded of him. He, the younger brother, has ADHD, too. It's taken a toll on them, the siblings. It's been hard on me and my husband. She said the worst part of all is the wondering. The not knowing is the hardest part, Rita said. Clayton would have graduated from high school on Friday if he was still in the area. He was supposed to graduate Friday night, said Rita, adding that the missed milestone is particularly upsetting. He had a bunch of friends and was known as the class clown. Clayton enjoyed playing basketball and football. He excelled at video games and was a talented artist. Rita said that his artistic ability was a positive aspect of Clayton's disorders. He had been on medicine since he was little, and we noticed that he could always draw and play video games really good. There have been no recent updates on the case, but there has been incidents of false hope. Rumors were spread at local high school that Clayton was no longer missing. Then we would get phone calls of people telling us that he was found, Rita told Oxygen. In addition to that, Rita said her husband's mom got a phone call from someone who claimed to be Clayton. The call said that the boys went across the border to Mexico. She, Clayton's grandmother, thought she was talking to Clayton. We contacted authorities and they said it was a scam. But there's always something in my mind always wonder if it might have been true. Clayton stood at 5'11 and weighed 160 pounds when he ran away at age 15. Has brown hair and blue eyes. His left ear is pierced, but he wasn't wearing any earring at the time of his disappearance. McBride said she and her teen get attached to the families they work with, Clayton's family included. Those birthdays, every missing day, affects us emotionally, but I can't begin to imagine how his parents feel, she said. I would ask each member of the public to take a moment to imagine a person they love immensely just being gone, day in and day out, living with the worry and heartache. Then use that feeling to realize how much they would want everyone to be helping find them.
Even if all you can do is share that child's poster or a story like this one on social media, that may be the one thing that the person with information sees, may be the share that gets them home. If you have any information on Clayton's whereabouts contact 270-393-4000 or 502-722-8181. Number 6. Nidas was last seen in Radcliffe, Kentucky on May 18, 2005. His fiancée had sent him out that morning to buy diapers and baby formula. He called her at 1.30 p.m. to say he was on his way home, but he never arrived there and has never been heard from again. Nidas was reported missing after he failed to return to his residence in the 1300 block of Bramblett Road in Radcliffe. His maroon four-door 2004 Chevrolet Tahoe was located the next day in the parking lot of the Dollar General store and Carbono's Italiana restaurant on South Dixie Boulevard in the vicinity of U.S. Highway 31 West. Authorities stated there was nothing suspicious at the scene. Nida's father stated his son had not planned to visit either Dollar General or the Italian restaurant the day he disappeared. He normally drove his Honda, but chose for some reason to drive the Tahoe on May 18. He usually only drove that vehicle when he had his children with him. Nidas was employed as a computer technician with United Parcel Service, UPS, in Louisville, Kentucky in 2005. He had just completed his probationary period. He is described as a good employee with a good work ethic. It is uncharacteristic of him to be absent from work without calling. His loved ones stated Nidas was a good parent and close to his children and would not have willingly abandoned them. He planned to marry his fiancée on his birthday in June 2005. Nida's fiancé has since married someone else. Two of Nida's close friends, Victor J. Brown and Jeffrey Puckett, were charged with trafficking nearly $100,000 worth of marijuana and cocaine three days after Nida's disappeared. The men were later convicted of the charges. Authorities believe Nida's was involved in his friend's drug activity, and his disappearance may be related to that. Brown stated a group of Hispanic males attempted to kidnap him while he was trafficking the drugs in Murray, Kentucky. It was his call to police to report the attempted abduction that led to his own drug arrest. The kidnapping suspects have never been identified, and no arrests have been made. Nida's family believes he may have gone into hiding to avoid prosecution or retaliation as a result of his own alleged drug activity. Although investigators stated there was no hard evidence of foul play in his case, his family is concerned for his welfare as his disappearance is unusual. His case remains unsolved.